Do you want me to stop at two? At the end, yeah. Okay. If we're here. All right, so there's lots of bonus out, and if you remember at the end, there's a class-wide bonus that goes on everything, and there's 100 total points, and you've already gotten 50 for the cards and 25 for the library assignments, so there's 25 still out. And that's the seven questions about the 13 parasites. And that is due uh, any format you want to do it. If you want to type an outline in sheets, that's probably the easiest. The only thing you can't do is cut and paste. You can't cut and paste what I wrote. You can read what I wrote and, and put it into some sort of format that you would understand, even one word, you know, like definitive post, blah, alternate host, blah, whatever. Uh, that's due on the 22nd and 23rd. You know, the two class are both having it at the same time. The ages donation for the lab record book, remember you don't have to do it. Uh, the lab record book, if you put the agenda and videos front to back, all in blue or black ink, no erasures, no whiteout. Uh, and if you put your lab data from back to front, uh, then you're going to get a 90 on your lab record book. But if you wanted an extra few points, you get uh, five more by doing a donation to Aegis. Aegis is an organization that provides all the information anyone would ever want about HIV AIDS, from um, research information to everyday person asking questions. And if you go to the first page of the website, and go down to where it says aegis.org. You can go on to the website and read and put any question that you want. Uh, you know, if you're afraid of something or if you're worried about something, if you want to know about something about HIV AIDS, you can type it into their uh, index and they will give you the latest information on it. And uh, they are supported by several big foundations, including um, Microsoft and the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, as well as the uh, Elton John Foundation and the federal government. Uh, the problem is uh, the, the foundations require that everyday people access the website to continue to get the money to run it. And so uh, they asked me if I could do, encourage my students to go to the website and give a minimum donation. Remember, it's not the amount. It's how many different people give a donation. And so if you give the donation, you click on Aegis Donation here, fill it in, and they will send you back a receipt that you will put here. You'll just cut it out or glue it or staple it right here in your lab record book, and it'll give you five more points. And if you haven't gotten your lab record book signed as a checker, don't forget to do that today. I have to sign it to show that you are a checker. All right, so that's the Aegis donation. Uh, by the way, to practice for the really, really big, really, really hard test that's coming up, uh, go to where it says, click here for Unit 3 Practice Virus Parasite Test. And this has 200 questions about general viruses, the 13 parasites, and HIV AIDS. And it is extremely good for practice. Extremely, extremely, really, really intense. It's going to be very, very, very similar. So please do that because I uh, remember the last material, everything since the midterm, is going to be given to you uh, twice. You're going to have this bi-weekly chapter test on it, and it's going to count twice. And then, of those 200 questions on this, I'm going to pick 100 and put them on the final. So the final exam is 50% this test and 50% your midterm. So uh, it is extremely important. You should have your paper done by now. You should be studying for the test that's coming up. After all, it's been two weeks since we quit inoculating. Yes? Uh, do we have uh, by the and the last term? That's why I just put up there. Ah, uh, this one? Uh, yeah. Right there. That's the best one to use. All right, so um, 
anyway, it's, it's, I don't know how to emphasize enough that you've got to study that old test and work out those questions. And uh, let's just put it this way. Last term, the lowest grade in the term was the pre-midterm and this test. And the average grade was 47. So uh, it is important that people go back and uh, you know, prepare for this test because it is all the lecture we've been spending four hours a day since the midterm lecturing. And that material is going to be tested on heavily. All right, quit threatening Don and get on. All right. So, uh, what else? Remember, you can get five points on the uh, final exam by doing the AIDS denialist paper, type one to two pages, listing what are the motivations. In other words, why do the AIDS denialists act this way? And then, how do they? What sort of reasoning do they use to convince people? Called the seven deadly deceptions. And uh, if you do that, you'll get five points added to the uh, whatever your uh, number you got correct on out of 200 on the final exam. Is that two pages and or one page? One to two pages. If it's single spaced, one page. If it's double spaced, two. Where do we? That's a movie. Nope. At the bottom of this page. Remind me when I finish. Oh. All right. So uh, a lot of people write because they don't want to write anything. That requires thinking. So I, there's an alternate thing you can do. There's a, a movie from a book. The book was called And the Band Played On by Randy Schultz. It's 1,100 pages long. I don't think you have time to read that. Uh, it is a nonfiction Pulitzer Prize winning uh, book documenting the missteps, prejudice, and mistakes done in the United States uh, in the early stages of HIV AIDS and uh, how we went from getting uh, you know, 4,000 people infected to having 1.8 million infected, which could have been probably stopped. And if the name of the book was And the, Play, and the Band Played On, and it's sort of a um, sarcastic comment uh, because if you remember when the Titanic was sinking, the captain of the ship didn't want people to panic as they died, so he had the band play while everybody died. And so uh, Randy Schultz says that's what the Reagan administration did, was they told everybody it would be no problem, and it would never be a problem, and it was anyway, it was too disgusting and dirty to talk about, and so uh, it's not going to happen, and it hit, hit their head under a basket. So that's why he named the book that. And then HBO uh, made a movie out of the first 200 pages of 1100. And that movie is called And the Band Played On as well. And it is very, very good and it uh, goes right up against the people we're going to be talking about. And so if you would rather uh, go to Netflix and get the movie And the Band Played On, there's good news and bad news. One, you'll have to have it mailed to you. They don't have immediate access to it. But you can also find it at some of the, I know you're going to say, they don't exist anymore. Blockbuster or some of those around. Project Free get. TV. Huh? Project Free TV, like Movie 2K. Maybe they have it. I don't know. Do you know? They probably do. If they do, send, you know, send me information. Yeah. All right, so you can do either one of these for the uh, five points in the final exam. Put it in your final exam packet. I will glance through it, look at it lightly, and give you the five points on your final exam. Remember that your formal unknown typed report is due for in-class grading on the 22nd, 23rd. If you meet the minimum criteria and you type it in the right format, you're going to get a 90 with just a few corrections that I will write on the uh, cover page, the title page. You will take it home, do those corrections get the grade that I wrote up there and put the final draft in your final exam packet on final exam day. Also, while you, I'm grading those papers, you're going to be taking this disgusting, long, bi-weekly test, and it will be chapter 10, 11, general viruses, the 13 parasites, and HIV AIDS. 
And remember, because this is everything since the midterm, it counts twice. Uh, the final exam, as I said, is going to be 50% from that test. 48% from the lab practical two midterm that everybody did really bad on the multiple choice and if you hadn't had word questions you wouldn't have passed. And two questions, actually four questions from lab practical one just so I can legally say I took questions from lab practical one. Alright, and there will be no pictures to identify. Okay, lecture today, we stopped at HPV and I'm going to give you a choice. Uh, it's, yes? How many biology tests are you going to drop? It depends on how many we end up with. And if we end up with uh, 10, I'll drop 3. If we end up with 8, I'll drop 2. So I haven't counted them all yet. So we have 9. Huh? With, with that, with the coming, we have 9 tests. So with these two, we have 9? No, eight, with right those 2, 10. Huh? If it counts as 2, 10, then. then yeah. In the beginning of the class, you said you were, you were going to drop three. I know. I did. But we didn't have as many as we normally do. So we'll have to see. I can't give, I can't give you giveaways. Um, it has to compare to other terms. But if he's right and there are ten, then I will. Um, the lecture today, what I wanted to give you the choice over is that this is already what you're going to get today, the first hour, hour and a half, is already online. I would rather skip to the HIV AIDS and do that and get most of that covered rather than uh, going to this and getting into the first one third of this. But you can decide whichever way you want me to do it or both. Ah, I guess listening helps. All right. So we can finish the last hour, uh, 45 minutes of the general viruses, which is human papillomavirus to interfere on. Or we can go ahead, since it's already recorded in a video online and easy for you to see, we can go ahead and start the HIV AIDS unit, which has more questions on it. HIV AIDS. Okay. Anyone want to go with the HPV one? I mean, all you have to do is look at... Uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, hey, professor? What they call bullet general virus 10, bullet general virus lecture 2D is the one that is uh, covers what you haven't quite had yet. General. Now, what, what was the question that somebody was battling? Yeah. Oh, what if we do for the bonus, if we do the summary and the video? Can we do that? You get stars in your crown in heaven. Okay. <laughs> And five points. Okay. Yes, if you're going to do the AIDS denialist, I'll show you exactly what you need to read. There it is where it says uh, uh, AIDS information service and it says bonus sheet final exam explains AIDS denialism, discusses the movie they use as their main propaganda tool. Office. Have to read, get to read, and then at the bottom of it, these are just talking about some of the famous people that at the very bottom, it's how to answer and the seven deadly deceptions. That's an incredibly long paragraph you have to read. Have to read. There'll be questions on what are the seven, seven, seven deadly deceptions on this thing. All right, so uh, we're going to start on HIV AIDS and there's two important points at the very beginning. Yes, I know, you have to actually know something. It's very annoying. Okay, so, um, let me pull this up here. Okay, so um, we're going to talk, there's two major points at the beginning in what we call AIDS history. And the two major topics in AIDS, well I guess there's three, 
right, in AIDS history, there there is the discussion of how we got the disease. Then the discussion of how we discovered the virus that causes the disease. And then finally, how and why did it spread? First, over Africa, and then to the USA, and then all over the USA. So these are the three questions we're going to be asking in the section called AIDS History. And uh, we're first going to just give you a little description of the virus itself. And this is a diagram of the structure of the virus. If you want to see the actual electron micrograph, it's uh, at the back under HTLV3, which is the illegal name of it. Uh, it is a virus, an enveloped virus, but one of the interesting things is the envelope has sugars embedded in it. These little sugars make it less immunogenic. It also has two strands of RNA and its own enzyme that's very unique. Uh, so it's a, quite an unusual virus because usually a virus doesn't carry around two pieces of exactly the same genetic material. So if your body is able to intercept and destroy this one, this one can still infect you. So that's unique. And it has an enzyme that only exists in class 5 retroviruses called reverse transcriptase. So that's unusual. Now, let's talk about that little... You said it has two strands of RNA or DNA? Two strands of RNA. All right, so let's talk about that enzyme. Remember that in normal protein synthesis, you have active DNA, and from that is made messenger RNA. And the enzyme that does that is called DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Now, since this virus is backwards, it starts out with RNA, and you've got to convert viral RNA to viral DNA, what would you think the name of the enzyme should be? The enzyme that converts viral RNA to DNA. Okay, let's have some brains here. Same thing as that, switch around. That's right, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. And it only exists in class 5 retroviruses. Now, I'd like for you to give a speech. And you would say something like, everything on Earth converts DNA to messenger RNA using the enzyme DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Now, don't confuse that with the retroviruses, which do the opposite. They convert RNA to DNA, and they use RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. Now, DNA polymerase, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase is the opposite of RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. <laughs> and it means it got, you see how you go to the little, little, And so they had to violate the naming protocol and change this name since it's the reverse of transcription, remember, this is transcription. And making this from it is the reverse of transcription. So they named it reverse transcriptase to keep the confusion down. 
And where do you find reverse transcriptase? How many organisms on Earth have reverse transcriptase? One class of RNA viruses, class 5 retroviruses, are the only thing on Earth that makes reverse transcriptase. So when you find reverse transcriptase, what have you found? Class retrovirus. Five. Yeah, class 5 retroviruses. All right, so that's an important um, sort of nomenclature and vocabulary thing. And this virus is one of the four that has reverse transcriptase. And it is single-stranded, and it uses reverse transcriptase, and it's in the phylum lentivirus, and it is in the class retroviridae, and it is a cancer virus. It causes cancer. So, it causes leukemia, and it causes B-cell lymphoma. It is an emerging virus. And who can tell me what emerging means? What's emerging? Right, it's the first... We, it has been here for thousands of years. It's just, it has been in such small numbers that very few people would note it. I mean, people die of unknown causes all the time. And most of the time, these are emerging viruses. They are viruses that have been here a long time. They're not any wild mutants. There aren't, aren't any wild mutant viruses killing thousands of people. They are viruses that existed in a very limited ecosystem, and we didn't live there in huge numbers. They're from the rainforest. You don't have people living in the rainforest by 500,000. And so if one person got it, you wouldn't even notice it. And that's why uh, we can document that this virus jumped into man, and something that jumps into another species is called what? What's the vocabulary word? So, 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 a, micro, a zoonosis. It is a zoonosis that we know jumped into man three times. It jumped in around 1900. It jumped in around 1940. And it jumped in around 19, 1960. So 1900, 1940, and 1960. But only the 1960 time when it jumped into man did it spread around the world? And you're supposed to be asking yourself, why? Why did it limit itself and just bubble around in just a few people in 1900 and 1940, but in, 19, in the late 1960s, it spread around the world? And the answer is, economic and social conditions were completely different. All the way until the middle 60s and late 60s, Africa was a rural continent. There were no megacities. There were everything south of the uh, desert, the Sahara Desert, was rural. Even capitals of countries were very small towns. And so, if people went out into the woods and hunted for food, and when they killed an animal, they skinned it. And if that skinning and preparation and cutting up the meat for food for their family, which is what hunters do, what we did when we settled our land, when that, if that blood or even um, lymph fluid had something in it that could find a similar host cell in us, and we cut our hands or had breaks, in our hands from chap skin or biting your nails or even the knife nicking you when you're making this, then that organism can jump species. And remember, a zoonosis is much more dangerous in the new species than the old. And so in the 1900s, there weren't many people. And they, if, if a hunter got this, at the most, he'd carry it back to his wife, and maybe she might pass it on to her child, and they would die. But they didn't live in large villages, and they didn't have lots of sex with each other, and there was no uh, blood transfusion or needles being used, and so it died when they died. And the same thing in the 40s. But 
there was a social transformation in the 60s because Africa was a completely different place by then. And if you look at this map, you'll see what happened. After World War II, the League of Nations, which became the United Nations, divided up the world into spheres of influence that uh, the different European powers could supposedly, and I know this is insulting to a lot of people, but this is the way history goes, it gets insulting, you know, between World War I and World War II, and even after World War II, the world was divided up into spheres of influence of the European powers, and they were supposed to go out and Christianize and civilize the heathen. And so they divided up China. Everybody knows, you know, that uh, China was divided up. Hong Kong was British. Macau was Portuguese. Uh, Shanghai, I believe it was French. They divided up Asia, India, Pakistan, uh, went to the English uh, parts, uh, uh, the rest of Europe, I mean the rest of Asia were divided up into spheres of influence, but Africa had the worst effect. And if you look at this, this is 1910, everything in light green was given to the French to rule. Everything in light pink was the English to rule. Everything in brown was the Germans. Blue was the Belgians. Italy got Somalia and Eritrea. Yeah, they did such a great job. <laughs> and um, the two independent countries were Liberia, settled by former American slaves, and Ethiopia that's been independent for a thousand years. So. Africa was divided into these spheres of influence, and when the Europeans went, they controlled the population. Uh, anyone here ever lived under a dictatorship? Okay. I lived in Brazil under the military dictatorship, and dictatorships or colonial rule are about the same. Uh, you don't have any choice. Everybody's given identity papers. And, for instance, when I lived in Brazil, the military was trying to stamp out communism. And so anybody that disagreed with them disappeared. I'm sure you've heard about the Argentines, how they disappeared thousands of people. They put them on planes and they took them out to the South Atlantic and they pushed them out. That's how they got rid of them. In Brazil, they just killed them. Uh, so uh, there was all kinds of controls to keep people in their place, and you had no right to vote or have any opinion. The government controlled everything. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, if you were under 21, you had to have permission from your parents and from the local sheriff to leave the city limits. And being a willful, difficult child that I was, when I was 18, I got my dad's car, and I, he was on a business trip, so I drove to the next town. And I'm on the highway, and in Brazil, the military police don't have police cars. They just stand on the side of the road like this with a machine gun. <laughs> That's awesome. And they go, if you don't, <coughs> no questions. So I'm driving along, and the policeman go, pull over. So I pulled over. They seized my father's car. They asked for my permission records. I didn't have it, and I spent three days in jail <laughs> until my father's company, don't tell the recording on this, bribed the police to get me out and paid essentially the same cost of the car to them to get it back. So this is what went on in these colonial powers. They kept everybody from doing anything. And what they would do is, the, and some were worse than others, like the French, they would intermarry a little bit. The Portuguese, they intermarried so much, if it was pretty, they married. But, you know, if it's the British, they were sort and the Belgians, it's sort of like, I'm sorry, you're not, you're non-white, so we're not mixing with you or marrying you. Yeah? What year was this? Sorry, I can't read it. In this, this was between 1910 and 1958. When Africa was being divided? 
was divided into spheres of influence, ruled by colonial powers from Europe. So the one we're going to talk about is Belgian Congo. Now look at the shape of this country. Have you ever seen a country shaped like this? Don't you think that's a little weird? It is. And the reason is, when the Europeans divided up Africa, they put the borders on their uh, possessions according to the way Europeans draw borders. And we're of European heritage, so what are our borders? Oceans, rivers. Oceans, rivers, and mountains is what how um, Europeans draw borders. We have the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Rio Grande, the St. Lawrence, dividing our country up. And if you remember, we even took from Mexico, Arizona and New Mexico, because we had manifest destiny. Remember, it was our destiny to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And no one was going to stop us. And so, Anyway, the way they drew the borders is not where people live. And so you look and you've got sort of two different kinds of countries in Africa. They have the current borders drawn in here. And you'll notice there are countries that are so small, they really would not have the economic power to exist. And then you have countries that basically kept the shape as their colonial power. Like the Belgian Congo, which became Zaire, which became the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So, why am I saying that? Because in this country alone, if you drew the borders of the uh, associated nation states, and what's a nation state? A group of people that have the same language, the same history, and usually the same religion, you will find that more than half of the people that are a part of the Congo, most of their tribe existed outside the Congo. Particularly the Tutsis and the uh, Hutus. And you remember, they had a genocide because those two tribes occupy the same land and detest each other. And each one tried to get a hold of each other and eventually thousands, hundreds of thousands were killed. All right, so, here you have a country where you have all of these tribal groups. How many? Seven tribal groups. Seven nations are going to be in one. Now, they're all attempted and still do to have parliamentary democracies. So, if you have seven nation groups, how many political parties are you going to have? More than seven. Do all, all Armenians think the same? You've got to have at least two for each group. So you're going to have about 14 political parties. If you have 14 political parties and each one runs a parliamentarian for each county, then at the end of a vote, no one will ever get a majority to set a government. So what happens is this group makes a deal with this group. And now they have a majority. And so they get to appoint the prime minister and set up the government and set up all the secretaries and all of that. And what happens is they only get 20% of the vote. The two together get only 20% of the vote. What is the rest? 80% of the people voted against them, but they got the most seats because they got together. So what is this a prescription for? Constant chaos and civil war. And what happens is this group gets fed up and makes a deal with this group, and then the government falls. It's like Italy. Italy has 26 political parties. They've had 190 governments since World War II. 190 times they had to vote, and it didn't stay. And if you remember, they just voted, and they never didn't get, nobody got a majority, and they have been now nine months in the middle. And you can't run a country that way. So. The point is, one of these questions, why did we not know, why did the rest of the world not know about this disease spreading around Africa? And the answer is, 
right now in the Congo, there are three civil wars going on. How do you know? Remember, the first sign that there is of people getting sick from this disease is 10 years after they get infected to 15, they start wasting away. They're eating the same amount of food, they're exercising the same amount, but they're losing 5 to 10 pounds every month. It's called wasting syndrome. And in Africa, instead of calling it AIDS, they call it slim disease. Because that's what people do. They slim down. That's the first sign that someone's sick. So how do you tell slim disease from starvation because nobody can plant because there's civil war? There's no food. No one can plant their crops. You can't harvest your crops because there's tanks and mines all around. So how do you tell? from the outside that something medical is going on versus this uh, chaos of, of civilization. You can't, and that's the big point in this. So, uh, a lot of people say, well, what's the solution? Well, the solution would be to redraw the borders. Try it. On the day after the fall of the Soviet Union, the United Nations passed a resolution saying all borders that existed the day before the fall of the Soviet Union are permanent forever. And the reason they did that was because the Soviet republics, some of the borders were drawn very haphazard, like Stalin gave the Crimea, which is mostly Russian, to Ukraine. And it was theirs. All their people lived there, and they've been there hundreds of years. And so uh, there are more Hungarians that live outside of Hungary than in Hungary. There are more Romanians that live on the borders than in. The country, Armenia is much smaller than the population of Armenians in northern Turkey and all that. So if there was a push for countries to draw the borders according to who had historically lived there, there would be civil wars all over the world break out. I mean, look at how many Poles live in southern Russia. Germans in Czechoslovakia. So, it would be a nightmare. So, they basically, the United Nations said, if one country wants to split into pieces, or people want to pull away from another country and form their own republic, they can do it if both countries vote by a majority, and there is no bloodshed or war, which is why Kosovo will never be recognized as an independent country by everybody in the United Nations, even though we want it, it doesn't meet the criteria. They had this horrible war over it, and they're still fighting over it. So the only country that has actually uh, gone through the process legally, according to the United Nations, is Czechoslovakia became the Czech Republic and the Slovakian Republic without any violence. You had a question, ma'am? Um, yeah, like, don't you just think that the U.S. would just cover it up? Because didn't they, aren't they the ones that were backing, um, they got, like, Mobutu in power or anything? You mean where? In, like, the, in the Congo. Yeah, like, I mean... All this was, and here's the big problem that was going on, was that when these were run by the Belgians and the French and, you know, Rhodesia by the English and all of that, um, what happened was many of the countries, particularly the British and the Belgians and somewhat the French, uh, didn't train the local people to take over their country. They were supposed to be coming in and showing them how to set up a successful country and be a democracy. Instead, they went in and used the local people to dig out the riches. I mean, the richest country in the world is what is now called Democratic Republic of the Congo. It has more copper, more bauxite, more diamonds, more gold than any other country in the world. It is also one of the poorest in the world. And at the time, you can even drive around Congo right now and see abandoned copper mines. Because what happened was the Belgians decided to put the Congolese people to work digging. And they brought in their own engineers and their own doctors. And they didn't send 
the local people away to be trained to come back and run the mines and, and do all of the advanced things. And so by the middle 60s, the, the people in the Congo got really fed up. And so they started a revolution to overthrow the Belgian rule. And what the Belgians did is they went to the United Nations and claimed that it was, and it was, a communist rebellion because the communists were the only people that were helping them. And so uh, they went to President Kennedy and they said, uh, come help us put down the communist rebellion in the Congo. Remember, just like now, when any country doesn't do what we want them to do, what do we yell? Terrorist. They're terrorist. All right? In those days, any country that didn't do what we wanted, we called them communists. And so we were on the wrong side. We supported the Belgians keeping the Congo. The good news is that the revolution was over before we could send troops, thank God. Because we didn't have C-5A aircraft and stuff like that to get them over there quickly. So have you ever heard of the great Belgian warriors? There aren't any. It's like the French, we surrender. You know? <laughs> so they don't fight. And so when the revolution was soon over, but that's not the point. What's the point is, when the Belgians were tossed out of the Congo, they did not leave friendly. They didn't say, oh, well, listen, let's let bygones be bygones. I went and saw in Kinshasa Zaire, in the hospital there, where they ripped the x-ray machines out of the wall. They took the engines for the trains. They took the generators from the electric power stations and they took them all back to Belgium. They said, you don't want us? We're taking everything we did for you back with us. And remember, they didn't train anyone how to run things. So all of a sudden, all the equipment and the expertise goes back to Belgium. And when they get back to Belgium, they say to the rest of the world, Congo, for copper, uh -uh. buy copper from Chile. Because if you, buy, if you buy copper from the Congo, you won't be doing business with Belgium. And so their markets collapsed. They had nobody to run things and set things up. Now, what are you going to do if you have no engineers, no doctors, uh, the equipment's gone, and you've got this unstable government? What are you going to do? Are you going to go next door and what cut oh by the way, what language do they speak in the Congo? French. What French? French? Yeah, French. The Belgians speak French and Flemish, and mostly French was the language of business. So they left, and these guys speak French and a whole bunch of tribal languages. And now what are they going to do? Where are they going to get their expertise? Are they going to go to France, which has colonies all over here? and trade one master for another? Would you? You wouldn't trade one colonial power that oppresses you for another. So where are you going to get your expertise? They got it from Haiti. In the, in the Western Hemisphere, the island of Haiti is French-speaking, and so they contracted with the Congo to supply doctors and scientists and engineers by the thousands for 10 years. So they came over and trained the people. So if you have a disease that is popping around in rural areas and the government falls, there is no more control of police telling you you can't go somewhere. There is no food. There is constant chaos. What are you going to do? People by the thousands, hundreds of thousands went to the big city to get food and to get work because they always imagine in the capital the streets are paved with gold and they get there there is no work there's hundreds of thousands of people what can you sell two things you can sell when you have nothing your body and your blood. organs blood. blood blood and your body so here you have a disease that would stay rural and put around in a rule. And then, remember, in the 60s, we introduced, thinking you're doing the right thing, lots of churches and lots of uh, philanthropic organizations tried to put hospitals in the interior of Asia and Africa. 
but they put them in where there wasn't electricity, where they didn't have enough needles, they didn't have uh, plastic gloves. It was a nightmare. So you introduce into an area blood transfusion and reusing needles. In most of these little <coughs> Presbyterian, Methodist, and Baptist hospitals that they set up throughout the center of Africa, they had seven syringes and seven needles for all day long. And they had no electricity, so to sterilize them, they boiled them at night. In the day, they somebody come in and they need their prenatal vitamins, they're not going to come in every week and get those. You have to give them a shot. So they clean the needle, wipe it off, give them the shot, wipe that off, and give it to the next lady. So if you introduce blood-to-blood -blood contact by non-sterile needles, and anytime someone gets really sick or really hurt, you start introducing blood transfusion in an area where there was none before, in which there is a disease popping around in the background, it's going to suddenly increase. And then you have hundreds of thousands of people moving to the big city, selling blood and selling sex. Now, let's say you live in a little village way out in the boonies, and your family doesn't have any food, there is no place, you can't plant your crops because there's, uh, you know, platoons of different groups coming across and causing disruption. So the guy goes to the big city in the capital to work and send back food and money to his wife and children. What's he going to do? He's six months in the capital. Is he going to play checkers on Friday night? He's going to go get a little hoochie. Uh -huh. And then, the once in every six months when he gets to go home to his family, he's going to go home to his wife, and he's, if he caught something in the city, he's going to take it back to his wife. If he had something when he lived in the country and went to the city, he gave it to the prostitutes in the city. So you have this sudden, a, a disease that would pop around and never cause any trouble. Suddenly, the introduction of poorly equipped hospitals with shared needles and blood transfusion, a social change by the loss of colonial control and the chaos it caused by hundreds of thousands moving to the big city, and then the, the only way they could get any sort of funds was to sell bodies, sell sex, or sell blood. So, then you have the truckers. And remember, HIV AIDS, uh, came from a subspecies of chimpanzee from the Cameroon, right up here on the border with Congo. And if you look at map where they plot by year, where they identify the disease, you can see that it spread all over Africa along highways by truckers. Because these there is no huge rail line in Africa. There is no, they have like five different gauges of railroad track. Every country had a different width of railroad track, so there is no interconnected rail network like in most countries. Everything moves by truck. And these long-haul truckers have lovely little places. Anyone ever been to Spain? Wherever you cross, wherever two big highways cross in Spain, you notice there's something that looks like a hotel? It's a hoe house. Okay? That's what happened all over Africa. These long distance truckers would pull in, they get for like three bucks, they get food, night, a good clean room, and a little entertainment for the evening. And so they would pack, you can, you can plot the spread of HIV AIDS all over Africa along with these major trucking highways. So, we've answered the question why we didn't notice it spreading all over Africa. We also, how it sort of, uh, what's the word? How it intensified and multiplied uh, in Africa. We didn't notice it because of the chaos that was going on. And how it spread so rapidly was huge numbers going from the rural areas to big cities, the introduction of poorly equipped hospitals, transfusion, shared needles in these hospitals, and then the movement back and forth of people from the big city back to the rural village and so forth to support their families. So, now we need to talk about the two ways that it got to the United States. And, of course, that's all we care about is us. So, how did it get?
to the United States? And the answer is, first of all, remember, you think those Haitian doctors and engineers didn't do any in the 10 years they were in Congo? Of course they did. And you think nobody got hurt and got a transfusion while they were in the Congo? Of course they did. So here you have it coming in to Haiti from the Congo and being intensified there in the blood banks and so forth. And then what did we have? The Haitian boat people coming by the tens of thousands to Miami. At the same time, in what year? 1976, New England ran out of, of blood in the blood banks. In those days, we transfused blood a lot more than we do now. Uh, why did we transfer transfuse so much blood back then. One, we didn't have the capacities we have now. When you get an operation, every drop that drains out of you, they put back in. But in those days, insurance paid without question. Red Cross made a cut, the doctor made a cut, the hospital made a cut, and they got paid without any sort of questioning. So they used unit after unit after unit in operations and so forth. You went in for a hangnail, they gave you a unit of blood. Not really, but you know what I'm saying. So, New England ran out of blood in the late 70s. What did they do? What do Americans do when we run out of our product? We low bid it. So, they low bid for plasma and blood products, put it out all over the world, and they imported huge amounts from the Philippines and East Africa. They tested it for everything known, but all we knew was hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and syphilis at the time. So they tested it, it was clean, and they used it massively throughout New England. So you have blood products, contaminated blood products coming into New England, and you have the boat people bringing it in from Haiti, and then, guess what the most infected city outside of Africa is? New York City. The leading cause of death in people under 50 in New York City is HIV AIDS. It is the most infected city in the world outside of Africa. And the reason is, just a second, let me get to it. The reason is, one, they had all this blood brought in for transfusion. Two, the popularity of IV drug use and sharing needles in the 70s. This is when it first big blew up, the heroin use and use of other things. Um, I remember when I was in college, we went to uh, New York and went out on the town and all that, and you would actually go to parties and they would have shooting galleries where people would go to a certain room and sit down and they would throw their money into a hat and go buy drugs and somebody would have works, which is this glass syringe and needle, and the uh, rubber tubing, and they would all buy the drugs and mix them up, and then they would fill the syringe, tie off their blood vessel, inject the whole thing, and then refill the syringe to get every little bit of the drug out, re-inject it, pull it out, and hand it to the next person. It was considered rude to refuse the works. Just like it's considered rude if you don't, if you, go, if you keep the joint to yourself the same societal pressure. And so uh, you have the introduction of untested blood, you have the introduction of this idea of lots of shared needles, and then, let me, I'll get to you in just a minute, uh, you have this sexual revolution going on. Remember, this is the 70s, and during World War II, the men went away to fight the war. What did the women do? Work. Stayed home and built the tanks. <laughs> stayed home and built the tanks and built the planes and built the guns. They didn't stay home to take care of the kids. They stayed home to go to the factories. Oh. And when the men are over at war, the one thing that they train all soldiers in is how to use condoms. They hand, they first of all they show you these movies where your things falling off and rotting <laughs> off and all this, and then they show you how to use condoms, and then they give you the little thing. Okay, you're going on a little R and R. If you come back with a sexually transmitted disease, there's going to be hell to pay, because the job of a soldier is to kill, and he can't kill if he's been over with gonorrhea 
alright? So, they train the men how to use condoms at, at, or birth control because you don't want to get that girl pregnant in that foreign country. That'll even cause more trouble. And you don't want to come back with a disease. So when the men came back from war, they were well trained and familiar with the condom. They get back and they say to their wives, excuse the French here, bitch, <laughs> get up tomorrow morning about 5 o'clock and make my breakfast. And I want two, I want ham, and I want eggs, and I want eggs over light, and I want them scrambled, and I want homemade biscuits, and I want uh, fresh squeezed orange juice, and I want the kids ready to go to school. And she said, well, you've got one thing right, we're getting up tomorrow morning. <laughs> but I'm going to my job, and you're going to your job, and I'm not getting up to make you all this big fancy breakfast. We're going to have cereal and orange juice and fruit. And you're going to help me out. And by the way, I'm not having 4.1 of your snotty-nosed little rats. We're going to have two kids. And we're going to buy a house and have a new car and go on vacation. We're not going to put all our money in raising your snotty-nosed little brats. And after World War II, the average number of children in an American family went from 4.1 to 2.2. I don't know how you get a .2 child, but anyway. <laughs> So, why? They came back and women had their own careers and their own ideas and men were expected to share the duties of raising kids and they weren't expected to have so many. They wanted to get the fruits of the American way, which was own your own house, have a nice car, and have a vacation, and send your kids to college. And you can't do all that if you have more than two. So. They limited their reproduction with a condom, which is a barrier protection, or the diaphragm, which is basically a big condom. <laughs> so, that's all good until 1961. 1961, they introduced the birth control pill. Prior to 1961, if a girl got pregnant, it was the man's fault. After 1961, man abdicated. They said, I thought she was on the pill. It's her baby, not mine. Before 61, if you got a girl pregnant, her daddy went to your daddy with a shotgun, and you were married, or she went away to live with her great aunt and came back with a sister. <laughs> and then after 1961, women started controlling their own reproductive cycle because they were responsible. The men said, hey, it's not my problem. I thought she was on the pill. I thought she was a modern girl. And, and everyone thought that condoms were disgusting and dirty and nasty and modern people used the pill. Well, the pill protects against nothing disease-wise. It only protects against one of the consequences of having sex whenever you want to, pregnancy. It doesn't protect against syphilis or gonorrhea or any other sexually transmitted disease. So, in 1961, the introduction of the birth control pill, that's still not enough to make it spread all over the United States. What happened next? The Vietnam War. And in the Vietnam War, American young people were furious. You see, on January the 17th, every year, the Secretary of Defense went and took 125 birth dates out of a big drum like we have for the lotto. And he, if your birthday, if you were 18 that year and your birthday was one of those 125, you were drafted immediately to go to Vietnam. I remember sitting in my dorm holding hands with about 300 other people praying that, our, that my friend's birthday wasn't one of the first 125. Because, you see, you could be drafted and go and die in a country you didn't know anything about and didn't care, but you couldn't vote, you couldn't drink a beer, you couldn't sign a contract, you couldn't buy a car. But you could die. And American young people were furious. They were angry, and they rejected all of their parents' rules and morality. And they said, look, we're going to be dying in three years. Make love, not war. And so the sexual reproductive rate 